Uh, great. Uh, so yeah, um, I am uh, wrote this piece of uh, interactive semi-fiction called American Election, uh, and I've written lots of other things, which we'll go into later. Uh, and today I'll be talking to you about it and how I created it and what it's about. Um, so. Um, the setup of the game is, it is 2016, Truman Glass has won the Republican Party nomination, and your goal in this piece of interactive fiction is to help him win the country itself. Uh, so uh, Truman Glass, uh, it's, it's sort of a pseudo-alternate reality, so he's, he's a sort of stand-in for the real Republican uh, candidate. Um, and throughout the development of the game, we actually shifted the extent to which he was the real life equivalent and not in different directions and got quite a lot of different feedback from our testers in response. Um, so we arrived at quite a particular place with that. Um, so um, the uh, following is uh, a recent uh, report by uh, the game's website, Rock Paper Shotgun on it, which sort of nicely summed up uh, what it is sort of about and thematically. So I thought I'd just go through that as a nice setup to it. Um, so uh, you find yourself in the position of your Abigail Thoreau, a staffer hired to work on the 2016 presidential campaign for Undonald Not Trump, as the website called it. You're the gay daughter of an immigrant and a racist arsehole, and you don't know what you're getting into, lie. You don't know who he really is, lie. You believe you can make a difference if you play this right, and I'll explain why the author here put lie in brackets. Um, so, uh, as the person here said, it is an ordeal. Um, this was supposed to be a brief news post, but once I got started, I had to see it through. This is apt. Abigail's path through the story can take different side streets, but heads in the same general direction. It crosses abuse, heartbreak, death, power, YouTube radicalization, and a lot of introspection. Though it follows the rise of a fictionalized tangerine mega baby to the seat of American political power, it tells a deeply personal story that's not really about him at all. And it knows you're not going into this as blind as Abigail is. Uh, and there's a brief little link there at the bottom for it, I think. Let's go up. Uh, Yes, if anyone wants to do it, that's the website link. Uh, so, um, uh, I thought I'd explain first of all what interactive fiction is, because many of you may not be aware of exactly what I'm talking about in this format. Sometimes I will use the word game throughout this. Sometimes I use the word interactive fiction, because it's a sort of border medium between novels and video games. Um, so, um, interactive fiction is prose-based fiction where there is what we call non-trivial interactivity. So, where you're, it's almost like reading a book, but instead of just reading, turning pages, you are doing something to the text that makes changes happen to its visual appearance. So in some interactive fiction games, such as my own, you make choices. Uh, in mine, choices appear in colored text. For example, uh, you might have directional choices. So you might be asked to like go left, go right, stand still, for example. Um, it, that's a kind of quite simplistic one. I'm not sure that kind of choice is that good, um, though sometimes it can have its place. But that's what you might imagine in terms of when you're controlling a story or going through a particular experience. Um, another set of examples, uh, which is a very big paraphrasing from my own game, is you might, for example, uh, early in the game, you're stopped by a police car on a lonely road because they've mistaken your plates for a different car. And you have the option to open your car door open your, uh, your window or lock the car when a belligerent policeman approaches you um, and starts ordering you to get out. Strategically, you face various options here that go beyond direction. You, there might be consequences for what you do that might make things go differently in terms of the story. Finally, there is another set of types of options you might have in this game, such as dialogue or social choices. So um, throughout this game, as the previous uh, review suggested, um, there's a mixture of the personal and the political. So you follow the storyline and life of your own character, as well as the big political events in which you're participating. Uh, at one point in the game, you flash back to an argument with your fiance, um, and she says, I love you. And you have an option to say, I love you too, which has a little lie brackets on the side to indicate that it's an insincere choice. Uh, you might try and distract from the conversation, you might stay silent. So there's a whole range of types of options in this, in this beyond like, vote this way, vote that way. It goes beyond that to moment-to-moment uh, -moment social interaction. Um, other types of, and I thought I'd th show a few screenshots from it, I'm not gonna say read out the whole thing, um, is uh, you might, for example, have a choice between two worldviews. So part of the way through the story, and this is more of the political side of thing, uh, you're, on, you're on the campaign trail, um, you pass this town, um, and you're musing on what's happened so far, um, and Glass's uh, appeal uh, versus that of his um, uh, uh, predecessor. Um, and in, in the choice you have uh, between for example, global warming will eradicate the world you know versus global warming is a myth. So you get to define your belief 
uh, as to events as this character. So a lot of people playing this game are likely to probably be left-wing people who may support the worldview of it, considering how it's advertised. Though we had a very interesting encounter at a show where we had someone who very much did not share this worldview played it. Um, and whether this meant it was particularly successful or unsuccessful at its intended purpose, they didn't necessarily see any problem with what they were playing um, and engaged fully in the experience uh, as someone in this mindset. Um, the game also goes through the personal. Um, so it's being controlled elsewhere, so uh, hence the process. Um, so um, you, for example, uh, flash back to September the 11th, 2001, though that's a slight spoiler because that's not really revealed until the very end of this chapter. Uh, where you're walking your dog along a lonely road. Um, and for example, in this bit, you get to choose wh how you treat your dog, whether you, for example, say good girl, good girl, or you know, insult your dog, how you play with your dog. And there's a popular uh, blog that follows uh, games and interactive fiction pieces that allow you to pet a dog, so as Robin pointed out, uh, to them. So that was very nice as well. Uh, so um, now, my main view on all this is people have short attention spans. Um, but they want to give it to things that they believe will last and remain with them that they believe are worthy of that time. Um, so my goals with this project were uh, to, sorry, trying to click through my own, engage with political events meaningfully and emotionally within the space of a narrative game. So a lot of games and a lot of uh, interactive fiction pieces don't really touch upon uh, history. They don't touch upon politics. They don't touch upon current events. Uh, recently in the news, big companies such as Ubisoft, uh, Activision, uh, such as uh, advertised on the giant Modern Warfare signs in the corner for some reason, uh, have vociferously denied that they are in any way making political things, even though one trailer showed people having to pick up their guns to defend the White House because it was burning, because terrorists, which were basically depicted as almost being like Antifa, etc., uh, were up in arms on the street and so on. Um, and uh, there's a refusal to say that things are political even if they are. So I wanted to outright make something that was explicitly political, but I also wanted to make it meaningful and emotional uh, as a challenge. So often things are one or the other, often in fiction in general. I wanted to distribute that game to as large an audience as possible, and I wanted to use feedback to define and refine a narrative pseudo-fiction methodology in order to increase the resonance beyond release year. So tying into the top, um, people have short attention spans, yes, so you don't want things to be too long, but at the same time, people don't necessarily, when they're engaging in a narrative experience, want it to be entirely disposable. They also don't want to feel like they'll be preached to. Um, they want something that will resonate beyond. So, um, I've said a work in progress beyond 2016 and 2019. So as expressed at the beginning, um, in 2016, we released early draft material before the election with a view to making a larger anthology project. Uh, so originally, I was going to uh, pile together my political games so far, introduce some new ones, and, and pile them all together about this particular moment in history, uh, although plans eventually altered. So we released this by itself. Um, this project was previewed in the Boston Globe, the Mirror, and major games websites such as Polygon, Kotaku, and PC Gamer. Um, throughout the last few years, um, in the midst sort of writing No Man's Sky narrative updates and various other things, we solicited feedback from testers from different demographics and locations, such as USA, UK, Europe, Australia, uh, with different acquaintance levels with games and pros. So it was important to me that people who went through this weren't just people who might be a traditional gaming audience, who, for example, may never play anything like this that's got so much writing in it uh, as a general kind of rule. So it's unusual for some of them. And I also wanted uh, acquaintance, uh, feedback from people that maybe had never touched anything like this before and what they think. Um, and then a few weeks ago, released American Election. Um, so some key changes between the preview and release, which I think sort of speak to my methodology in this uh, and things we discovered. Um, so first of all, we altered the script over the three years about 47%. So uh, we ripped out a ton of chapters and we added a ton of chapters. We vastly condensed on the material. We changed most of the character names um, and a lot of other big differences. Um, one big one was that the president's now called Truman Glass. Um, so at the time I used a lot of kind of, I, I tried to go for this kind of uneasy semi-fiction reality effect where all the kind of stupid names that all the politicians were calling each other, I gave them in the game. So whatever the side was, they all had the kind of equivalent thing. So the, as was mentioned, the main character from was called Drumpf. And, and so on, um, as if it was real. Um, I was trying to go for a kind of surreal, kind of almost horror, kind of muddy effect with it. But, as I'll go into in a second, really didn't age well. Um, we also vastly increased the, the fictional elements. So um, in the game, uh, originally, 
um, although it's always been what I would describe as semi-fiction, um, a lot of it was sort of um, uh, very, very specifically what was happening in the news right then, in a way that even like two months afterwards, people sort of seemed to have this like despising towards, um, not, not uh, what I spoke to uh, as testers, um, when previously sort of had gotten very positive response. So I was, I was very aware of how things were perceived outside of their time frame uh, for this type of experience. Um, iconography featuring actual political slogans uh, was removed. Um, so um, some of these were uh, specific slogans talking about the wall and so on. Uh, we didn't use any of the actual trademarked ones because, um, uh, as I believe, uh, I think the Republican Party trademarked um, or someone trademarked Make America Great Again involved in it. Um, so uh, we didn't actually use any of those. But um, we originally had, as you saw in this picture at the side, big signs that bore various phrases throughout the game. Um, and we found it was far more powerful to replace them with kind of more iconic representative images, such as like a giant stack of burning televisions and things. Um, and people seem to really get less distracted by this um, and seem to reject it less. The idea of rejection of fiction is a big uh, thing in all of narrative theory, and I'll go into that in a, in a moment and how it plays into these things. Um, the story focus centered on the personal life of the political protagonist, explicitly removing away from over-engagement in the specifics of 2016. So we even had references to the whole Melania thing where she'd sort of like plagiarized a, a speech by someone else. Um, we had a lot of references to particular jokes at the time, um, very specific things that were happening around the debate, um, and a lot of which uh, was immediately aged out even like two months later. Um, it also wasn't, it, it, interestingly, in terms of even in the feedback at the time that we had in the early previews, those bits weren't even necessarily seen as the strongest elements at the time, or which was telling us a lot of stuff. Um, so, um, some elements had aged themselves out of existence. Um, appeals to humor and event recognition did not last the test of time. I'll just check the actual time. Okay. Um, and, uh, in a ratio of what we decided was about 80 to 20% fiction to reality, we found the right path. Um, and I'll go into what I mean by that in a minute. Um, but uh, overall, um, we wanted to seed real events or very close to real events throughout the narrative, particularly at certain punchy dramatic intervals, such as the end of a chapter or the end of something that seems very personal. So you're not even thinking about the political. So we have a collision between the two types of storytelling uh, in order to produce more powerful effects. So, uh, almost at the end, uh, how was it received, this recent release? Um, so, I've um, uh, got a very nice uh, comment here. If a generation from now someone asked me what it was like watching the rise of Trump's America, I might show them this. Uh, the RPS review said there are acres of emotional and social subtext. It hits far too many levels of uncomfortable reality to be taken lightly. The sense of dread never lets up. Um, Haunting, emotional, immersive, uh, heartbreaking, human, one of the most important indie games that you can experience this year, um, and more stuff about it being generally horrifying. So it's a kind of a weird mix of me. Thank, thanks for enjoying it. I would write back on Twitter, and it's like I, hit, like, I had a panic attack or something. It was <laughs> the message sent. Uh, but all good feedback. Um, so takeaways uh, and what I learned from this project. Um, so I decided to, and I, this is a key thing that I think is very important for all of this, is to use the personal and emotional as a medium through which to engage with news and the political when you're doing these types of experiences. Games have a kind of inherent fictionality about them anyway, even when they're, like, everyone's always analyzing them in terms of how they are or are not narrative. So even if you're trying to make something that's real, within the space of allowing someone to do something in a news game, they are immediately engaging in a fictional act because they are participating in events in a make-believe format. Um, so uh, to use that and to think through the theory of that um, is crucial. Um, there's this whole thing um, uh, in Greek tragic theatre, uh, obviously like thousands of years ago, um, there was this play called, I think it was called The Capture or Sacking of Miletus. Um, and the playwright in question submitted it for the Festival of the Great Dionysia, um, and he moved the audience to tears. But in moving the audience to tears, he was then fined, um, and the play, I think, was thrown out of competition because he'd made them cry. Um, and by this, it was basically that it was too soon. It was seen as too relevant to current events, despite the fact it had huge emotion levels involved in it. I think about that a lot when doing things relating to narrative and news and so on, because there's ways of, of harnessing and capturing that and, and problematizing those feelings without sort of being banned or fined. Uh, so 80% um, fictional, 20% real. Um, so by this, um, there's a phrase in narrative theory called the suspension of disbelief. So the idea that um, when we're engaging in, in the fictional, we don't want to be constantly reminded that it's not real, generally speaking. We want to, to, to pretend it's, it's real for a moment, even if we know it's not. Um, 
And this kind of fictional enjoyment is key to hold someone's attention for an hour and a half in a single playtime setting and get them to invest in those decisions. Um, but by it sparking in those particular moments, such as suddenly bringing in 9-11, um, suddenly bringing in uh, real references to Trump and actual policies, um, we, we try to punctuate that fictional dream and unsettle that, those emotions, build them up in order to puncture them at the side. Um, we also wanted to have uh, clear, unambiguous naming to communicate that political element. So we wanted people to know they're going into something political. So um, I think I actually had a comment on this website that said, oh, it was a bit political or something. I was like, it's called American Election, which I sort of don't really know how to deal with. Um, and uh, however, most of our other advertisements decide to focus on the personal dramatic element because people really don't want to be signed up to be preached to. Um, they don't want to feel, especially for that amount of time, um, if they're coming to learn, then they won't be engaging in the story properly, even though the story is attempting to communicate and make people think about things. You sort of have to have Mr. X. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's that. Um, so just, I thought briefly, just some of the other things we're working on, so you can have a general picture of all that and stuff. Um, so um, I'm working on another so sort of political project, though not explicitly so, um, with Macmillan uh, called 16 Horses. Um, so that's coming out in 2021, it's a novel. Um, so it's set in a dying English seaside town where the heads of 16 stolen horses are found buried in circles of the farmer's land. A forensic veterinarian and a local policeman work to uncover a frightening mystery. Um, and uh, we've sold in about 15, well, more than 15 international territories, I think, now. Um, and it's sort of ambiguously set in a post-Brexit world, um, partially ambiguously, and it's not out yet, so we can respond to whatever happens in the current uh, months. Uh, but there's a general feeling of discontent about uh, the UK's uh, periphery and what kind of sentiments and political uh, trends are rising there um, is, is all tied in. Uh, though, it, obviously, it's a mystery story and there's a lot of other stuff going on as well. Um, I also, uh, as mentioned earlier, I've written various video games recently, uh, so I do a lot of more uh, mainstream stuff, but uh, we can blitz past that. So those are various games I've worked on. Um, so if you played any of those, then that connects that for you. Uh, and yeah, that's it. So. <laughs> my prerogative as introducer to ask the first one, uh, which is, um, could you talk a little bit about sort of where you see the crossovers with journalism being? Sort of how does interactive storytelling work for journalism? How does it diverge from journalism? Um, do you think of yourself as trying to represent a sort of real experience of what being part of the American election would be like? Um, do you see some of the techniques being useful for journalism or not useful for journalism? Um, just any thoughts you have? I think on ambiguously that? so. So um, my previous release, uh, Paper Brexit, which I think you mentioned earlier, um, is far closer, although it still has a large fictional element um, to it. Um, so that took place in a sort of, it was set in a, a oh, um, it was set in a cafe uh, um, and was also released about three days prior to the referendum itself. Um, and in this cafe, you are a journalist who reported on Brexit and the run-up to the vote. And it's set about a year or two after a hypothetical vote. Um, and um, it's all got kind of nightmarish naming again. I think I sort of hedged my bets on who would be prime minister by calling the prime minister Doris Thompson. Um, which ended up weirdly skewing to what happened um, as a sort of uh, combined amalgam figure. Um, and in that uh, game, uh, it sort of uh, had uh, you directly piece through actual events and discuss them, express your opinion on them systematically um, in order for the person you're talking to to then try and use your logic against you in a sort of logic trap uh, throughout the title. Um, which um, making choices, um, if you're clever in your choice design, you can predict what people, the, if people keep making certain types of choices, you can have things like hidden stack counters and so on that basically can try and predict things about the user's behavior in order to then do something similar to a joke where you set up certain expectations only to defeat them or throw them back at you later. Um, so um, in American Election, um, which was far more kind of, I would say, on the kind of fictional side, especially what it turned into, um, we do certain things that try and make it more kind of 
behaviorally, I, I mean, this is all totally, <laughs> but like the, 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 me theorizing out loud, but I, um, sort of uh, conceptually journalistic, I would say, rather than like literally so. Um, so we try to deal with behaviors um, and patterns um, and trends in society as systems so that the kinds of choices you made and the kind of behaviors you, exp you, you acted on or expressed interest in are fed back to you and passed back to you through, var uh, through various means. Um, uh, one of the biggest bits of this was um, uh, towards the end, um, you, as mentioned with the YouTube radicalization moment, uh, where you play as a boy uh, in his room going through YouTube and kind of feeding through the rabbit hole effect of more and more kind of extreme videos being shown to you and your response to them. So it was all like, heavily re rooted in the news and, and research, but kind of fed through this kind of storytelling lens, uh, kind of fable-ish, I guess, rather than uh, having a lit that literal sense. Um, and I think kind of journalistically in terms of responding to the news, kind of that kind of the former, that kind of shorter experience, but, but taking those lessons can far more skew towards like literality, like literalness. Um, because you, you don't have that burden of I'm investing two hours in an experience right now, which I think demands a higher degree of fictionality. So I think almost like the length of the project would determine some of those, if that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely, cool. Um, so open to the floor. Um, does anyone have a question? Uh, you've got a mic coming to you. Um, how did you promote and publish your game? Oh, um, so um, with the early preview release, um, I sort of spammed various people <laughs> with it, which sort of sort sort of works and sort of pissed people off, and I didn't really know what I was doing as much then. Um, with the new release, um, partly I had a, a I, I don't have a huge platform, but I have a, like a, about like five thousand Twitter followers or something. So it's not like as big as some people, but it was a decent one to, to get going with. Um, so I pasted up on there uh, the uh, places these things are sometimes hosted on. So there's some big websites such as itch.io that, that will let you host these and run the kind of service based them for free. Um, uh, I contacted them asking for would they help me promote it. Uh, so they featured me on their front page, which drove a lot of kind of traffic quite naturally. Um, I also contacted directly various publications, some of which have said they'll play it, so I don't know if they will. But like, I've sort of been doing that. Um, I've, uh, we were talking about me doing various things in my spare time. I'm sort of finishing my novel at the same time now, so it's a big uh, kind of tendency to go from one to the other of, 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 of messaging and getting it out there. Um, and uh, also, um, uh, with, with these games, um, there's obviously a crossover of kind of non-traditional audiences who might be interested, especially because it's kind of prose-based, um, and gaming audiences um, who are also not as easy to sell as you think for something like this because it's quite different to a lot of experiences people engage with. Um, so I've been trying to engage with the actual interactive fiction community um, uh, with their websites and, and so on. Um, and I've also traveled to various games events uh, to promote this. So there's an event in London called Adventure X that I showed an early version at, at the uh, thing at I can't remember. It's now at the British Library anyway. Um, and went to Toronto to the Wordplay Festival to show it. Uh, and, and or to talk about it and doing a talk on political uh, stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, um, and, and all those streams uh, as well as sort of contacting kind of certain individual people who I think have liked or journalists who've written about my past writing another medium to, to tell them about this has sort of helped as well. Hello, um, you talked a little bit about how uh, elements of narrative theory help explain why people engage in fictional stories. Do you think there's any particular elements of the same theory which we could use to you know, engage people in non-fictional stories as well, to so how they understand the real world? Sure, um, I mean, I, it's quite a, a expansive question for me to immediately pick up upon things here, um, but a lot of narrative theory deals with both categories of fiction and other other forms. Um, obviously, with uh, kind of if you know something's being presented to you in a non-fictional frame, you're not going to require some of the other things you'd, you'd normally need, like suspension of disbelief and so on. Um, interestingly, though, um, uh, with the kind of the rise of the mistrust in news or kind of belief in fake news um, and the actual existence of fake news and, and falsified narratives, it would be kind of interesting to see how those categories blur or how or how people will start to judge these things, not quite knowing, almost like a 
rather than a suspension of disbelief, almost like a kind of uh, paranoia of disbelief um, uh, might come in. Um, but I think I think also it depends on the kinds of, um, as, as many people in this room may know more specifically about this than me, uh, but the kinds of articles, uh, the kinds of uh, things being produced, for example, kind of longer features that are often kind of scene set are clearly borrowing from kind of narrative kind of archetypes to, to, to move into it, whereas obviously shorter pieces may, may not. Um, uh, though um, there might be an interesting kind of thing to think about in terms of theories relating to short stories and so on about about length and bursts and focusing, up, but but that that's very like it, it's it's slightly unanswerable in terms of the the, the breadth of uh, that. Yeah. It's a slightly less highbrow, but um, uh, where are the loot crates, or rather, how do you monetize this? So um, originally, I was considering uh, charging for this or one of these experiences or the anthology. So there was originally on the original release a, a pay what you want uh, figure for that, which was OK, but not substantial um, in terms of what they're raising. And then those kind of models often aren't, unless you have a huge audience and so on. Um, so in terms of the monetization of this particular experience, um, partly I made this experience because I wanted to. Um, so this was, was partly a passion project and, and an interest project in terms of uh, the structure of it. It's also, if I was trying to like justify to my accountant or something like that, and then that kind of frame of mind, you could argue it might be like a loss leader, so to speak, because I've released this experience for free. Um, and it was more important to me that a broad audience play this, and I was able to test those strategies and how that worked and get a broad sample of feedback than it was to... Because immediately charging for this, even a small amount, you're having sort of the barrier of somebody even having to in, in, into their details, which is going to just cut that off. Whereas getting, you get va everything about this was trying to make it easy to play. So the original release, you had to download and run on a Windows PC or Mac, and you had to set it up and install the EXE and whatever. Here, we redesigned it all so it's playable in browser. So you can just go into it, it's there, it loads, you go in. Um, so um, whether... Yeah, so I may just have screwed up the monetization, but I'm, I'm getting more people to play anyway, uh, which is good. Um, and I'm doing fine with the other stuff, so I just wanted to do it. So uh, may, may do it in future if I was to do, or run out of money or need more things. <laughs> so. Last question. Um, what tools and stack did you use to develop the back end to, and to analyze like the unit user data and behavior? Uh, so with uh, user data and behavior, although there are such tools that are available for, so um, in terms of the general programming of this, this was made in uh, Unity, uh, which is uh, a gaming kind of uh, engine. Um, and we used a thing made by um, Inkle Studios called Ink uh, to, to actually script the game on, on, in terms of the storytelling. So it's a plugin you can get that I believe is royalty free for, um, and can be compiled to web as well, actually. Uh, for interactive fiction and choice-based games. And it can be used to handle, from my end, a lot of more complex coding things. So it can queue in music, it can queue in art, um, and so on. Um, we could have, if more had been spent, time had been spent on that, ripped out player testing data and stuff like that directly. We relied more on, on uh, picking people or getting people to sign up and then getting them to self-report or sending them through. Uh, uh, kind of questionnaires um, t about their playing experience. So it wasn't as much directly relying upon our actual kind of ripping out the specific behaviors. Although although that is quite hypothetically possible and would be a very good idea, uh, though we did not do that. Um, though doing that, um, you can also rely on, um, there's a lot of anecdotal or actual data in, term in games in terms of the kinds of choices that people respond to or don't respond to as well, um, that kind of big, big companies have done um, about, so people often don't really like to be bad in video games, for example. People generally behave ethically uh, more than, so if you've got a lot of games will have an option and it's often kind of caricatured as you're like, do something really nice or like, like kill Hitler or join Hitler or whatever is the, the two choices uh, that a game might offer you. Um, it's far more uh, effective if you're trying to entice people to engage in bad behavior for whatever reason to fool them into doing it um, and lead them down a path. There was this amazing uh, game called Bioshock 2. Uh, where throughout the game you're sort of, it's sort of this Randian dystopia um, and you're looking for your kind of lost daughter uh, who you lost years ago when she's here and she's grown up. Um, and you meet various people who are involved in your separation from her um, and um, who have ruined the city and led to this kind of economic kind of political nightmare. Um, and as you meet them, you can choose, because as in a lot of games, the primary method of, of contact is, is violence, whether to kill them or not. 
uh, these people. Um, and then when you finally meet your daughter towards the end, it turns out she's been watching every single interaction you've had and has sort of pseudo-based her personality upon yours. So it's encouraging you to engage in almost vengeance or, or, or just killings at some points or mercy killings at others, but it complicates it by having someone else observe and respond rather than your character being decided, which is a, a, something that was is, is sort of a much more effective way of getting you to engage with that side of storytelling than it would be if you sort of had the direct option. But that's the kind of learning from some of those types of things, which I cannot unfortunately offer you from my own uh, coding of this game. Um, thank you very much. Sure. It's great to have you great. here. Um, big round of applause, please. <laughs>